So I was actually supposed to film this video yesterday after the onsen, but honestly, the onsen in Ikebukuro made me feel so relaxed at night. I had the best night's sleep ever. I got home and I just passed out, like straight away. It was amazing. But today, guys, I just want to like speak to you about my reasons for moving to Japan. I've been kind of reminiscing about 2018 and the big changes that happened during that year. And of course, the biggest change for me was moving to Japan last August. It was just a year of a lot of things happening. And my reasons to move to Japan might be slightly different to other people's and I feel like there was a really weird break in my channel last year where I was just making videos from my room in my apartment in Leeds and then suddenly it's like bam I'm in Japan and I never explained it to anybody in fact I don't think I even like mentioned it on social media that much I think the most I did was post a tweet saying hey guys I've got my visa I'm going to Japan but I think that was because I was so focused on getting this visa and I was so nervous of being denied for some reason. I read like a bunch of horror stories online. I'm gonna go into the whole visa process in one of my future videos because I think it would genuinely help a lot of people out. But I was just freaking out. I was so worried about not getting this visa that all my energy and all my time just went into planning Japan. Which is good to be honest because it made things a lot easier once I got here. So yeah, I'm gonna be talking to you today about why I moved to Japan. I personally really wanted to visit Japan for a very, very long time. Probably my well, the good part of my entire life, at least. And I think for a lot of people, it's either they find out about Japan and they love it and they're obsessed with the idea of Japan, or they know Japan exists, but they don't take any interest in it. I haven't really met anybody who's kind of in between about Japan. When I spoke to people that have visited Japan, they either absolutely loved everything about it or they were a bit unsure just because it's so different to any other place they've ever been to. Um, and it's true, Japan is very, very different to many other countries. And I have lived in a lot of countries. That's This is probably why my accent is so mixed. I get so many comments on my videos saying, where are you from? I don't understand your accent. Um, and it's because I've lived in many different places. So I think I just picked up some kind of a weird twang or something. I don't know how to explain it, but this is why my accent is so mixed. So the first time I actually started to probably think about Japan was when I moved to the UK. And bear with me on this one, but it was when I moved to the UK and I was suddenly exposed to watching Sailor Moon. Um, and I know that sounds ridiculous to a lot of people, but that was the first time I ever found out that Japan exists. And to get a little bit of a perspective on that, I was born in Uzbekistan, in a little city called Samarkand. And I was not exposed to any of the cultures from other countries. I was kind of living in this tiny cultural bubble. We, I don't think we even had a, like a proper television. We had like one channel on TV and it was just most, mostly like people doing Uzbek dancing and stuff. So that's the only thing I was exposed to. We didn't have the internet. Um, it was a very simple life. It was like in this tiny little area in Samarkand. And most of the time I just spent outside playing with rocks or going to school. And that sounds really grim, but that's just what it was. And this is not to talk badly about Samarkand or Uzbekistan because I love Uzbekistan. It is a beautiful, beautiful country and I miss it every single day. But living there, I just wasn't exposed to any of the influences from the West or the East or anywhere else. All I knew was Uzbekistan and Samarkand. And to be honest, I really loved my time in Uzbekistan. I really, really did. I could understand everything people were saying because I was fluent in Russian and I was learning Uzbek in school and my family are ethnically Uzbek Russian. So I really felt that I fit in there culturally. But when I was in my teens, I moved to Ukraine and then I moved to the UK and I didn't know any English at all. Like at all. I knew hello and goodbye and my name is Mariana, but aside from that, I knew nothing. So it was really difficult for a child to kind of like fit into this new culture um, and go to school, which I did. I went to school like every other kid and not understand anything anybody is saying to you. And obviously I think that kind of caused a lot of like kids to bully me in a way. Um, I was really badly picked on when I first arrived in the UK just because I was so different to everybody else. Like kids can be really, really cruel. Um, and the only thing that kind of kept me going throughout the days in school was coming home and watching Sailor Moon. <laughs> and that's basically what it is. When I started to watch Sailor Moon, I w discovered that Japan basically exists. So I would come home and I would watch it with subtitles on. It was a very odd experience now that I'm thinking about it because you watch it dubbed, subbed, but I was watching it dubbed in English 
um, with subtitles on. So I was like reading the subtitles trying to understand what was happening. And I actually think that Sailor Moon helped me learn English as well, which is crazy. So yeah, that show kind of gave me something to look forward to every single day. And I also think it made me a better person in general because if I had nothing to come back to because I didn't know anybody and I didn't really speak the language at the time, it would probably make me a very miserable person. But that show did make me a kinder person because I really took everything she said to heart. But yeah, so that was the first time I was exposed to Japan and I took an interest in Japan. So fast forward a couple of years and by this point obviously I had the internet and I had access to literature and I could speak English now which was awesome. When you're a kid and you're in school you start to learn pretty pretty quickly which is great. Um, the best way to learn a language is to fully immerse yourself in a culture. Um, and I started to research Japan at this point so I started to look into the culture of Japan and I started to look into anime a little bit more but not not from like a, a perspective of I love anime but from the perspective of how it is animated and what goes into the storylines and I was really really into Go Nagai's works um, I took a huge interest in it that's why I love Devilman Crybaby so much because they finally like did something with one of his previous works and I just started to learn more about Japanese culture and I think through that I discovered that I love learning about other countries so if we fast forward a few years um, due to my parents work and my work um, and my university courses I've traveled to Nepal, I've traveled to South Africa, I've been to Dubai, I've lived in various places and I've worked in various places and I really loved this idea of traveling and exploring the culture but not really as a tourist and more as somebody who actually lives there and that's actually why I picked to do geography at university because I was so so interested learning about the world and during that time I really studied Japan and I've always wanted to go and visit Japan and explore the nature and the culture culture but it wasn't really a possibility in my head that I could actually work and live here. I don't know why it wasn't, it just wasn't. Like it's not something I ever thought about. Like thinking about it now, I would have loved to do that. If I knew I had that option in the past, I would have been a much happier person. But for some reason it just didn't click in my head. It was really odd. So once I finished my degree, I got a job for a company and um, the job that I got was like in a marketing department and it was it was pretty good. It was a, it was a good job. It was very stressful, but I did get to deal with a lot of like international offices it was very interesting but this is where things kind of started to go south for me um, I took that job because first of all I left university and I wanted to be a productive member of society um, and secondly I needed to make money <laughs> so I didn't take that job out of my sheer love for the job I took it out of convenience and because of what it offered which logically is a good thing to do but for some reason it made me so so miserable like I was miserable in this job but I was still sticking it out like I wasn't gonna quit or anything however I think maybe the stress of the job or just my general unhappiness really got to me um, and I got very very sick and when I say I got sick I mean that I could not walk for two years and that's because one day I woke up and I was feeling crappy as always because I was heading to my work and I couldn't stand up like I literally couldn't stand up there was something in my back that was causing me so much pain I just could not stand up at all and I rang my mum and I was like what the hell I can't walk um, and at that point I thought oh it's sciatica oh I pulled a muscle oh something else so I took a little break from work um, to try and recover and I went to the doctor and he was like oh it's fine it's just sciatica take all these painkillers there you go um, so after being high for like two weeks of the painkillers the pain didn't go away it got worse so at this point my job were like no we're not keeping you on unless you come back and I was like I can't walk like I physically cannot get up and, and it really annoyed me like that really bothered me um, because it was a very high pressure job and you kind of have to be in top condition to work there and it I quit like I literally just quit over the phone it was like two weeks of painful hell and they wouldn't understand despite me providing a letter from the doctor so I just quit and I was like screw this I'm gonna sort my health out properly so I've waited like a couple of months and during that time I went back and forth to the doctor and he just kept giving me more painkillers like I had so many painkillers by the end I was just happy because I was on all these painkillers and then my parents were like this is not okay you have not been able to walk for like two months so you need to go see some somebody who's a specialist so I went with a private 
doctor um, and in the UK if you go with a private doctor it's very very expensive but at this point I think my mom and my dad were so desperate that they would do anything to get this sorted and I to this day I don't understand the gravity of the situation because like I said during that time I was so happy on these painkillers that I didn't even realize how serious it was that I couldn't walk so I went to the doctor and he did a lot of MRI scans, a lot of x-rays. I had like, I think in total I had about six or seven MRI scans over the period of like six months. And they were like, we can see a lot of inflammation in your lower back, but it might be, might not be a slip disc. We don't actually know. What we're going to do is we're going to give you steroid injections. So I got the steroid injections and they helped, but only for like a month. And within that month, I came back to the doctor and I was like, I can't walk again. Like I could not stand up. Imagine this is my back. Well, it was like this constantly. So if I wanted to walk, I would have to be hunched over fully. And at this point, the doctor was like, how about we give you another steroid injection? If that doesn't work, we're going to have to like open you up and have a look and maybe see if it is the slip disc that is causing this. And I think this is the point where it started to sink in for me. This was about eight months into me not walking properly. And this was the time when the stress of everything and the constant appointments and just physically not being able to do anything I wanted to do, it started to sink in and I lost my shit. Like, I am not kidding you. I was freaking out. I was panicking. I was crying. I was just a mess because I was so used to being this free person in university, going places and traveling places and going out with my friends. And suddenly I couldn't do that. And this was also the point where I started to regret a lot of my decisions. I started to regret not going out more. I started to regret not seeing other countries. I started to feel the fear of missing out when I saw people go on holiday or go traveling and go do something else and I couldn't do that and I just felt trapped because all I could do was just stay at home all the time and before this whole thing happened I actually had an acting and a modeling agency and I would do a lot of work with them and obviously I had to leave them too I couldn't do anything that I enjoyed doing it was just nothing but the four walls of my living room. It got so painful and so uncomfortable for me to stand up and my muscles got so weak as well, like my leg muscles, it was so so weak that I even struggled to make myself food. Like somebody had to be constantly at my house to help me and that just made me feel so depressed, like I had zero independence. So after the time passed and the second steroid injection did not work, um, I went back to the doctor and I was just like, I give up just do the surgery, I give up. Um, the reason I was so reluctant to do the surgery in the first place is because it was next to my nerve. Like there's a really big nerve in your back. I think it's called the S1. I'm not really sure. I honestly don't remember. Like I said, it was all a blur, but it was right next to my nerve um, and the inflammation was around the nerve. So there was a lot of risks involving working on that area. Um, we did have a fantastic doctor though. I, I completely trusted him, but still I was very, very nervous because when I read the list of things that could happen to you during the surgery, like you might never regain feeling in your legs. You might have tingling in your arms for the rest of your life. You might never be able to walk again. Um, it was just very, very scary. So we went ahead with the surgery anyway, and I got it done. And I remember like going in to the hospital and just crying. Like I was convinced I was going to die. I am terrified of general anesthesia. I had a really bad experience with it in Uzbekistan. And basically I woke up during surgery when I was six. Um, I cut my appendix out and I woke up during surgery back then. So every time I go to get some kind of a procedure where I have to be put to sleep for a short amount of time, I freak out. Like I am so frightened. Um, and I was just freaking out and they had to give me a sedative to calm me down. It was, it was a big fiasco. Um, but the doctor was really understanding and they got me into the surgery and apparently when I was waking up from the surgery, I kept crying and asking for tissues, <laughs> which was really odd. People do very strange things when they're under anesthetic. Yeah, I woke up and he came into my room and he basically said, we know what the problem was. <laughs> you had an extra bone growing out of your spine. And we could not see that on the MRI. And I was just like, what? <laughs> it was just the strangest thing ever. He said he has never come across anything like it before. My spine was fine. My discs were slightly degenerated and there was like the tiniest bit of inflammation around the base of my spine. But that was not what was pressing on my nerve. The thing that was pressing on my nerve was an extra piece of bone 
that seemed to have grown there over the last couple of years. And he was like, so we removed it, we got rid of it, you will be fine. Um, and I was, on the second day, I could walk. Like I could literally stand up straight and walk. And it was like my life after two years of not being able to do anything has completely changed. The recovery was kind of long and that whole experience really encouraged me to start using my time wisely. So I started to watch documentaries and I started to do the things I used to like. I started to watch anime again. I started to watch Sailor Moon again. I was like, no, no, this time I'm gonna watch the subbed version because I'm gonna watch it in Japanese with the subtitles on. And I just did all these things to try and like broaden my mind a little bit. And after a while, when I was feeling completely fine, I got another job, but I, like deep inside, I just felt like two years have been stolen from me. Like they were just taken away from me. My time was gone. And no matter how much stuff I watched about Japan and travel and other countries, I just didn't feel like I could do it myself. And I remember when my cousin was speaking to me about what I actually wanted to do in life. And I think that was like the first time I was fully honest with her. And I just burst into tears and I was like, I want to travel. I want to go to Japan. I want to live in another country. I want to explore the world. Um, and I was like hysterical because this, this was the first time that I admitted that I actually wanted to do something outside of my immediate comfort zone. And she just went, so why don't you? And at that point, it's so simple, like it's so stupid because it's so simple. But at that point I was like, oh my God, I can, like I can do that stuff. I can do whatever I want now. I'm no longer trapped. Um, ooh, getting emotional. Wow, I did not expect this emotional response. <laughs> this is why I was nervous about making this video because um, I think just even thinking about it makes me um, like really emotional for some reason. It's so stupid. But it was the first time that I realized that I could do whatever I wanted to do. Like I was not held back anymore. What she asked was just a really difficult question for me um, because not only would it meant that I might admit something that I don't think that I could emotionally do, um, but also because it would kind of solidify the fact that I wasn't happy at the time. And it did, it really, really did. Like it, this whole feeling washed over me and I was just so relieved, but at the same time, super distressed. It was really weird. So after that, I started to research how to move to Japan. Um, I have had a fascination with Japan and Japanese culture for such a long time. And it wasn't just the anime, it wasn't just Tokyo, because I've noticed that a lot of commenters seem to think that I'm in Tokyo 24-7. It is true, I do live and work in Tokyo, but I have been to other parts of Japan and I've got a lot of plans to go to other parts of Japan this year as well. I wanted to see the nature again. I wanted to immerse myself in another culture again. I wanted a complete change from the life I've had before. And I wanted to be able to do the things that I couldn't do for those two years. And the only way for me to do that and to get that shock of independence is to move to another country and the only country I would ever consider moving to is Japan. From the popular culture perspective of anime and manga and from the geography perspective, like I love geography, I have a degree in geography, both geographically and culturally Japan is the most incredible, the most fascinating place I have ever 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 been to. Um, it was the best decision I've ever made moving here and I'm so happy that the anxiety of not being able to do it didn't stop me. I'm so happy that I just didn't give up so easily because so many times during that two year period I just I wanted to give up like completely. It was the worst two years of my life but I'm fine now <laughs> and I'm in Japan and I'm getting to explore Japan. I've met incredible people. I have seen amazingly beautiful scenery and I can't wait to see more of Japan. I think to move to Japan took me about a whole year to prepare if not longer, because for the visa that I'm on, you have to save up money, you have to prove your eligibility. There's like, there's so many stupid things that go into play, um, only for them to look over it in 10 minutes and be like, yeah, whatever, that's fine. 
So I don't know, I'll make a different video about the visa that I'm on and what I'm planning to do next. But yeah, this is everything. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you did, please leave me a like and subscribe. I hope that you've taken something away from it, like don't give up so easily. Don't let things in life stop you from doing what you want to do. Don't let other people tell you that you can't do something, but also don't let yourself tell you that you can't do something because sometimes we are our own worst enemy. So yeah, um, I will speak to you next time. Bye.